All right, I do have um, some slides and just a few um, updates, talking points, announcements, that kind of thing. Um, the first time we ran through this, it went about a half an hour, 35 minutes. Um, so we should still have time for Q&A. Um, Ginny will, if she hasn't already, in the chat, she'll post the instructions to ask questions um, either anonymously or otherwise. Uh, either way is perfectly fine. Um, and you can send them to her if you um, want to have her ask um, questions related to any of the topics today or anything else uh, we'll try to cover. Um, Obviously, as we've been having these town halls, we've been talking, and I'm gonna, I have two screens up, so if I'm not looking right at you, I'm sorry. Um, the, uh, the, the status of COVID and its impact on our campus is obviously at the forefront of everybody's mind, uh, in front of everybody's mind, both personally and professionally. Um, we are currently at our, um, at our modified yellow um, category that we've been at for the last uh, uh, probably four or five weeks uh, at the university. We've not made a change. Uh, the trends on campus uh, have been down a little bit overall over the last several weeks from a peak of about 69 cases in a week uh, down to the low 50s um, this last week. I will say that our COVID team uh, is a little concerned that we're having some fatigue about, um, about uh, reporting. Um, and so we would encourage all of you and all those you work with and work with in the classroom, um, students to, um, to report through the self-report form so that we can do the contact tracing that we need uh, to do to continue to try to keep campus as safe as possible. The COVID health team has added two additional um, COVID uh, investigators to help um, with that workload. Um, it's a significant workload. In a typical week, we're dealing with uh, dozens and dozens, if not even hundreds of contacts from the campus community related to um, exposures, actual uh, positive tests, pending tests, probables, all of those issues that you all have heard about. Um, but I would encourage all of you to continue to engage with the Roaring Back website, utilize the self-report form for those possible exposures, as well as um, known positives and uh, other questions and concerns can be submitted through the COVID hotline or the COVID email. Um, the governor is, I think, scheduled to make another announcement tomorrow. Um, we're in, we did take a step back uh, a few weeks ago into uh, Idaho stage three. Um, that really didn't require modification at the university level because I think we were already sort of ahead of the game. Um, it, it really didn't impact, that change did not impact our operations in a significant way. Um, we, um, we do have, <coughs> excuse me, um, some other issues related to um, enrollment and, um, and the academic schedule that I think are worth covering. Um, enrollment for fall semester was down about 5%. Um, this, uh, this impacted uh, our budget. Obviously, we still have a ways to go in terms of balancing our budget. You all are aware of the cuts that were made over the last year. Um, there are discussions ongoing right now with the state, with uh, legislative, as well as the governor's office and the budget office about um, sending back some of the funds that we, um, that all of higher ed ended up cutting. Um, this is primarily due to the uh, very rosy um, tax uh, collections that are occurring uh, as we continue through the rest of this um, academic year and fiscal year for the state. Um, to show, so there is um, uh, at least a movement from the university presidents to try to look at ways that we could potentially receive some of those funds back to support uh, our programs or at least help to support some of the expenses and costs associated with uh, COVID response. Um, as I started to say, enrollment is down about 5%. Um, that's offset by uh, increases in 
um, graduate student enrollment. The, um, the other uh, place where we've seen significant declines is in the dual enrollment students with high school. If you look at just the traditional undergraduate population, it's down a couple of percentage points uh, with our graduate student enrollment being up a couple of percentage points. And I want to point out that many of that uh, is because of work that you all have done within the Division of Health Sciences to recruit, to grow additional um, student programs. And um, that has been very, very helpful for the overall budgetary picture of the university, not only for the importance of growing our programs to meet the healthcare needs of the state. So thank you all um, for your efforts there to grow and maintain enrollment. Um, just uh, <clears throat> go through these points on this slide a little bit more. Um, we've already talked about our operational levels and some of our on-campus COVID trends. If you have additional questions, you can shoot them to Ginny and I can address them. There is um, a new committee that's being set up um, by Academic Affairs working with the Roaring Back Subcommittee to take a look at um, and review recommendations related to um, the impacts of COVID on our faculty. So uh, examples include the impact of teaching workload on high flex courses, adjustments to the tenure and promotion guidelines that might need to be in place, um, the changing landscape of online teaching, et cetera, et cetera. So you may uh, be contacted to either participate in this uh, impact subcommittee or see um, correspondence from them soliciting feedback and guiding the work of that group. Um, they are a subcommittee of the Roaring Back Instruction Subcommittee uh, committee and, um, and we'll be trying to address these impacts on uh, faculty with regard to teaching, academic progression, et cetera. Um, when we talk about uh, face coverings and face shields, there's been some slight change in guidance overall uh, at, the, at the university level based upon new information that's come out, either publications or CDC guidance. Um, and so we communicated this in um, ISU today uh, about a month ago, um, that face shields should only be worn without face coverings if there is a need for an accommodation, either with the instructor or with um, uh, students in the classroom, um, we really are recommending that masks be used, a cloth face covering be used, um, but that in those certain situations, a face shield, a clear face shield uh, can be used. It, those things, uh, if they're used, we should be um, uh, trying to maintain a distance of at least eight to 10 feet from that first row of students. Um, and, <clears throat> you know, there are some other settings where face shields are okay. If a student or employee has a, a medically um, justifiable reason to, to not wear a cloth face covering. And those folks really should talk that through with disability services. That unit on campus has been the group that is um, working with faculty and students to um, provide those uh, face shields and provide those uh, accommodations as necessary. Regarding employee travel, under the yellow and orange category, all non-essential travel is really eliminated. We've done a tiny bit of travel within the division, um, but and, and if it is essential, you can send those requests up uh, to our office and I'll talk with you about those. Um, instructional uh, travel between the campus is exempt from that approval process. Um, candidate travel, so when we have applicants on campus um, for, uh, for, for job interviews, um, we're asking that those be approved and talked through as well as we um, structure that. Non-essential travel for students is also uh, prohibited at the present time. Pro, um, requests for uh, essential or required mandatory travel for students uh, is being approved through uh, student affairs uh, as they interact with the student organizations. Um, on campus group size at the present time, we're at 10. That's our modified yellowish orange um, group size. So um, we want to make sure that that is um, critical, mission congruent kinds of events and um, that we limit that to, to 10 people or less. 
If you have to have 10 or more, we ask that you uh, submit a health exception request and that'll be reviewed. Um, the online form is still available. It's actually been modified to hopefully make it a little bit um, easier to fill out and more intuitive. We continue to have students, faculty and staff serve as health ambassadors. Um, these folks have received some training. Um, they are walking through high traffic areas on campus, reminding people to wear face coverings, reinforcing um, good behavior when they see it. Um, and if you'd like to volunteer for the Health Ambassador Program, you can contact Allison Johnson uh, in the President's Office. Allison is the President's Event Planner and um, she's helping to coordinate the efforts of the Health Ambassadors and we really appreciate uh, her doing that. Um, I've already given you a little bit of data um, on enrollment. Um, as, as we said, most of the um, declines in enrollment overall were due to uh, dual enrollment students, probably confounded by the fact that our uh, local school districts across the state are doing things very, very differently. So the enrollment in dual enrollment students is down several hundred students overall. Um, our total on camp, our total campus um, student uh, population is 11,786 for the fall. Um, that's as of census day. I did mention that um, graduate students were up. Um, the other areas where enrollment is up is uh, with transfer students. So within state transfers were up 2.9% out-of-state transfers were actually up 41%. It's a relatively small number of students that are out-of-state transfers, but um, we're up uh, 41% uh, this semester. Um, we anticipate that enrollment will still be a problem in the spring. Um, the budget models uh, account for about a 10% decline fall to spring, that's the normal. Um, and we're really interested in seeing what happens. Obviously in many of our programs, because they just carry right on through, we're not expecting much attrition. And we asked um, all of you about um, expected attrition and problems that you were seeing in your students. Um, most of that information, um, and we shared that at our administrative council meeting uh, last week, uh, you, you certainly can talk with your leadership that was at that meeting. Um, we provided that report, but most of the concerns were related to disruptions in jobs in terms of income for our students, uh, issues with homeschooling, childcare, and those kinds of things um, causing problems for students uh, in um, working through their schoolwork. Um, so, you know, we, we really um, want to project a supportive environment for these students as we move forward and move into spring. And if there are issues that come up that you feel we could support you with, um, we want to hear about that and we'll, uh, we'll work closely with the department to see what we can do um, to improve that situation. In terms of scheduling changes in the spring, um, the first day of classes will begin as originally scheduled on the 11th. There will be no classes held on Martin Luther King Day, which is January 18, and President's Day, February 15. Um, the university, university will be closed as normal on those three-day weekends. Spring commencement has been moved to April 24th, this is the Saturday before spring break starts. Spring break was also moved from its typical slot in March to April. Um, it will be April 26th through 30. And um, then there will be one week of online distance-based final exams, May 3rd through 7th. Um, this is very similar to what we're doing in the fall around the Thanksgiving break, um, moving directly into um, final exams uh, right afterwards. We know that there are some exceptions. We know that there are some issues related to clinical rotations, practical exams, hands-on kinds of things. And those are, are going to be um, in all likelihood approved um, for all of you that um, need those kinds of exceptions for um, getting your students uh, finished either this fall or again in the spring. Um, and the spring semester then will end on uh, May 7th. Um, similar to this semester, the EISU uh, fee <clears throat> will be refunded. Um, 
because so many of our courses are online anyway, that that is going to be uh, refunded. That's not necessarily a permanent change, but it is going to be in place again, um, again for spring. And as you all know, um, finals will be administered online. Computer labs should be open for students who have uh, limited access to computers um, or who have difficulty with their home uh, internet. Um, people have been asking what's the spring furlough plan um, related to kind of the budget and finance situation. I talked a little bit about some of the financial impacts and how this is a bit of a dynamic uh, environment as, um, as there are requests for um, um, returning some of that uh, fund rescission that we sent to the state over the course of the year. But as of, um, as of now, the furlough plan is going to continue um, in the spring. So those of you that uh, have to take furlough days, um, you took half of them in the fall or will be taking half of them this semester. Um, at this point in time, uh, taking uh, a furlough will be required uh, in the spring as well. The Office of Human Resources will be distributing individual furlough notifications um, to all of you that have to do the furloughing uh, over the next several weeks. And um, really it's consistent with what's on the HR website related to, um, related to the furlough planning that we've been doing all along. Um, is the university planning another round of layoffs in the spring? The answer to that is no. Um, we are in a reasonably good uh, shape for our budget. Uh, provided spring enrollment is in line with the projections um, and the furloughs are, are taken as scheduled. Um, if spring enrollment is um, down significantly, we could see other impacts um, related to budget. And that's things like um, an extension of the hiring freeze, delays in hiring, salary savings and the gathering of that money has been an active and conscious part of um, maintaining our budgetary, um, our budgetary goals. So I know some of you have been very frustrated in your departments in terms of getting people hired. Um, I'll be honest, I'm, I'm being told I have to drag my feet um, and HR and, um, and other uh, academic units are also dragging their feet in this process to realize some of the salary savings. And I know it creates hardships in the department, but the salary savings is very, very important to uh, us being able to balance the budget at the end of the day. Um, there have been some uh, surveys that have done um, and there's information available um, in student affairs and academic affairs about um, the student course feedback survey. By far and away, students were very grateful for the options that faculty provided to them and the work that we all did to try to make campus safe and maintain the best academic environment that we can. There were, um, there were a few complaints uh, about things like um, Moodle's functionality and other things in this survey, but I have to tell you, if you get a chance to take a look at it and we can get a link to you, um, by far and away, students were very appreciative and complimentary of the faculty um, across the university. So we, we really appreciate um, everything everybody did uh, to be flexible and to be uh, as student-centered as possible. Um, COVID-19 has really created some unprecedented challenges for faculty pursuing tenure. Um, and in recognition of this, we've worked in academic affairs um, to look at um, COVID as an exceptional case under ISU policy, the promotion and tenure policy. And so as a result, the university will offer basically automatic approval of faculty who request to stop the clock uh, in, in the tenure process due to COVID. Um, no additional information is really necessary. We just need to hear from you at the divisional office. Uh, and in academic affairs, or we'll pass on the information to academic affairs about those of you that have requested a stop the clock based upon uh, COVID impacts. Um, information was mailed out on October 15 to all faculty. So if you, um, if you want the details on that, uh, it should be in that email from October 15. If you don't have that, let us know and we can, 
um, we can get you the details on that, but it's really a, a very simple process to request um, a stop the clock. Um, a couple of other little things. Um, after a lot of hand wringing and difficult discussion, um, I, I think you all are aware now with Kevin's announcement that uh, to do what's best for the health and safety of our campus community, uh, and to follow current health recommendations, winter commencement has been moved to a virtual format. Um, it's now scheduled for the end of the semester on December 12th, um, and the commencement team is working hard to ensure that graduates uh, will still be honored in an, in an appropriate way, but unfortunately not the ideal way that we like to do commencement each year. Um, about a couple of weeks ago, um, all employees were invited to take part in an employee engagement survey uh, to share how they feel about ISU. Um, it's meant to identify barriers that may exist um, wherever they may be, whether they're uh, workflows or other processes um, <clears throat> on campus that can and should be addressed. There's a lot of good um, I think comments that have come out of these uh, engagement surveys. There was another one done shortly after Kevin arrived in 2018. Um, and those results are available at isu.edu slash engagement survey. Um, steps have been taken to make sure that this is an anonymous process. Um, and so no contact information is requested or collected. The electronic data collected by Qualtrics uh, the date and time stamps and that kind of thing will be removed and not connected to your response. Um, questions are optional. Uh, you can request a paper version if you'd like to do that um, and fill it out uh, in a paper format. Um, and, an, and an employee engagement task force of faculty, staff, and students will be put together to review those data to make recommendations for improvements and um, the general themes, the numerical results, not individual comments, but the themes will be posted online and shared with the campus community. So I'd encourage you um, to take uh, the time to fill, that, um, to fill that survey out. So um, we're uh, at 11.26. And I'm happy to try to address uh, questions that have come in. I know there are some in the chat here. Let me pull that up. Oh, it's mainly Ginny letting you know of uh, some of the links that I referenced um, as I went through the presentation related to operational levels, the academic calendar, um, and uh, otherwise. Uh, before I do take questions, um, Amy Hardy from our faculty advisory um, committee is, I think she's here. Um, Amy, are you here to say a few words? I'm actually not seeing Amy on my list. Amy had requested some time to talk about um, the FAC. Um, Chris, do you know uh, what Amy wanted to say? I know that she, she wanted to just reach out to the faculty and let them know that they're available for feedback um, and to provide input um, to carry through to um, administration and through the FAC process. Are you aware of any of the other um, items that Amy wanted to talk about? Yeah, I, I think she wanted to uh, just talk just briefly about what the role of the faculty advisory committee is for the KDHS, just kind of reiterate those points. Um, and also specifically address issues that have come up with University Curriculum Council. Several proposals have been uh, put forth from the KDHS uh, that have been DHS wide. So DHS prefixed courses, uh, the Bachelor of Science in Health Science, a minor in healthy aging programs and offerings that don't belong to any one college or department, they're KDHS wide. And so she wanted to talk about the, the role of the uh, FAC in being kind of the curriculum council, reviewing KDHS wide course offerings and, and reiterating the fact that these are representatives of the faculty from the different units within the KDHS who want to have that dialogue with their constituents about these kinds of KDHS wide wide course offerings. So that was the gist of what she wanted to, to talk about, but 
obviously it would be great to hear directly from her and maybe she can come to a, a later meeting. Yeah, I see a couple of phone numbers on our list. I don't know, are any of those Amy Hardy? I'm just gonna ask if she's here one more time. Okay, well, um, let's, um, thanks, Chris. I appreciate that. Um, Ginny, any questions popping in? Hey, Rex, yes. The first one, um, we have a few. The first one is, will any of the CARES Act money make its way back to the departments for extra costs that might have been incurred due to current circumstances? So the answer is possibly. Um, some of the CARES Act money, and there are actually multiple pots of money beyond just the CARES Act. There are, um, there are some other state uh, pots of money that have been um, allocated to higher education. Some of that money has already made it back to some of our departments, particularly those um, that have had clinic operations significantly affected. Um, the, the CARES Act money and the, um, the subsequent requests, there was a second request, there's even been um, additional requests. We haven't heard exactly how that money is all going to be distributed, um, but I, um, you know, I, I would, I would like to hope that um, a lot of that money will make its, make its way back to our departments that have been impacted. I know that you all have worked um, on very short timelines to provide uh, input into uh, some of the costs that we have incurred. I do know that at least with one of the requests, um, we requested as a university over $4 million and we only got about 800,000. So about 20 cents on the dollar in terms of what was requested and what was received. And um, the Office of Finance and Business Affairs is still working out how that's gonna be um, distributed. So um, it's been a little bit disappointing, but by the same token, I think there may be opportunities coming in the future for additional funds. Um, obviously as the federal administration um, turns over and Congress um, gets to work again, there may be um, additional relief funds that find their way to um, the university and we'll be reaching out to you when we have those opportunities to apply for some of those funds. And as we get a decision made as to how some of the funds we've already received are gonna be distributed. Thanks, Rex. Next question about enrollment. Is the KDHS enrollment down as well or just the university overall? If so, at what percent? So the KDHS um, enrollment is up a little bit. It's a couple of percentage points up. Um, and our numbers, it's always a little tricky because we um, sometimes uh, institutional research includes pre-professional students in those numbers, undergraduates. Um, so overall, our numbers are up in the division a couple of percentage points. We know several of our programs have grown quite a bit. I think it's in the, the pre-health um, students that we see a little bit more variability um, and that counteracts some of the growth that we've had. But if I remember right, um, our uh, increase was in the range of 2 to 2.5% is what I'm remembering, which is great in this environment, obviously. Thanks, Rex. We have a question to post the link to the student survey results. And I know that Leanne and Jackie are, are working with us on that. So we should have that shortly um, or after the fact, if, if needed. Um, next yeah, and question. And I think that was, I think student affairs was, was kind of owning that survey. Um, mm -hmm. And we'll have to, we'll have to get a link for you. And I apologize. I, I, I didn't have that in my notes and didn't have it on the slide. There's a lot of good information. There's the data we saw was very raw. It wasn't um, it wasn't condensed and collated, uh, but I think they would have done that by now. Okay. Um, next question: Why are students included in faculty and staff results task force? Um, which task force? I guess I'm not. Um, I will ask for clarification from this person and let me circle back on that one. Okay. Was it one of the things that I mentioned? Employee survey. Um, okay. So why are students... Student, we do have student workers. Um, 
so were students included in the employee engagement survey? Oh, yes, they are. They are supposed to be included. My notes uh, show full-time, part-time, temporary, and student workers should have been solicited to be included in that survey. Yeah. So if they are employed by the university, they were included. Correct. Okay. Yep. Got and it. I'm not sure if that includes CPIs or if it's student workers. I actually don't know the answer there. Okay. Um, next question, what is the status of the College of Health Dean search? So um, that's a great question. And I was just going to look on here. Chris Brock, the chair of that search was in the last uh, town hall, and I probably should have invited him for this one because that question came up. Um, the committee is in the process of doing phone interviews. I think they had eight or nine semifinalists that they were doing uh, phone Zoom, Zoom type interviews with. Um, they had a long list of questions that they were asking those individuals. Uh, Leanne uh, Waldron helped them to put together a very nice prospectus to provide uh, to those applicants. And it's expected that they will be able to whittle down that list to uh, three to five uh, finalists that we would then um, interview in the spring. We'll have to deal with um, COVID related travel restrictions and otherwise, but I would really um, like to have people here in person for those interviews in the spring. Oh, um, I'm getting an update here. The last interview by Zoom is next week. Um, and the committee will meet next week to um, to whittle that uh, that list of eight or nine semifinalists down. Thanks, Connie. Connie's helping that committee with that those details. So thank you. Okay. Thanks, Rex and Connie. Um, also related to hires, um, what is the KDHS able to do to ensure Meridian and the KDHS faculty representation on the search committee for the provost? Well, I absolutely, I absolutely will make it known that we want to have representation from um, from Meridian on that committee. Um, I have not heard anything about the composition of that committee, and I've not heard anything about um, you know who might be appointed as the interim provost. Um, I think that uh, Kevin, at least in one meeting, said that those decisions about interims would be made. Um, by the first part of December, if not sooner, um, because it would be good to have a bit of overlap um, with Laura before um, she departs in January. Um, I absolutely will advocate for KDHS representation from Meridian um, on that committee. Great. Thanks, Rex. Um, in regard to commencement, since some students out on field work slash clinical rotations won't be able to come back for commencement in person or virtual since some work weekends, would programs be able to have their own celebrations, hooding ceremonies, et cetera, after they're done? I think we were discouraged from having individual ceremonies in the past, but maybe I'm remembering wrong, and this is for the spring. Yeah, you're right. There was um, a, a discouragement of those um, individual ceremonies. And um, if I recall right, last spring, we had really, um, in essence, multiple ending dates to spring semester. Um, we just talked about this in our academic affairs meeting right before um, this town hall today. Um, and we're going to talk with the registrar again. The provost will talk with the registrar again about having um, some additional end dates. So if people are pushed out um, because of the, an inability to complete some of their field work or their clinical work, um, and they don't quite finish by the regular graduation time, by that May 7th date, that we will have opportunities for additional um, term end dates. Um, that being said, those, um, those celebrations, I think we'll have to talk through as we get closer to um, to the end of um, the end of spring semester and see what programs are affected, see the numbers of students that are affected, see whether or not we might be able to have them um, graduate at that May 7 date um, officially. 
Um, those kinds of details I think we'll have to work out, but I will say that we're gonna try to build in a similar amount of flexibility in terms of term end dates that we did this last year. Okay, thanks Rex. Um, that is all that I see on my end for now. Um, so I'll turn it back over to you to elaborate on anything or offer some closing statements. Okay, one of the things that I, I didn't mention during my COVID update was that we are looking at developing some testing protocols. Um, and so we have a testing subgroup uh, of our COVID health committee that is um, made up of representatives from a, across campus, from athletics to housing, uh, to nursing, to public health, to university health. Um, and uh, lab science, Rachel Hulse is very involved in this process as well. And this group is looking at um, developing some protocols for testing when we come back uh, for spring semester in January. Um, in all likelihood, because of the availability of testing um, supplies of the instruments to do the testing, uh, the test kits themselves, we've had trouble even with um, swabs and pipette tips. Um, within Southeast Idaho to get testing done. Um, we, we are looking at doing some prioritized testing likely in high-risk populations, potentially in students that need to be in clinical settings um, because uh, many of our partners for clinical training are requiring that kind of testing before they uh, allow students into that setting. Um, and we're also looking at um, doing testing uh, of other high-risk individuals or students in the dorms, for example. Um, we may be able to roll out even more widespread testing. I think many of you um, have heard about Northwest Nazarene University moving towards at least once a week testing of all their on-campus population. And I think that Utah um, as a state is moving in that direction as well. So that may influence what we do, but what will also influence is, is availability of tests and test kits. And that's been a problem. We have several thousand test kits uh, on order at the present time. Um, and we're gonna be collaborating with athletics that's ordered some testing, as well as um, university health that's ordered some testing and um, with our public health districts to uh, order test kits through the state to be able to put together a package and a suite of testing options for campus. So I did wanna, I guess, briefly talk about that. And we're working on how we're gonna prioritize the use of those tests um, at the present time. And we'll have a plan together by the start of spring semester in January. Um, any other questions pop in or anybody else? Okay, go ahead, Jenny. Yes, a couple. Um, so related to the test kits, the question is, are those test kits something we pay for? That we would pay for? Mm -hmm. um, the answer is no. The university is going to figure out how to pay for those, whether it's from CARES Act funding or other funding sources that come, come through. So if we need to have testing um, for your students, for example, to go out on um, field work or clinical rotations, um, we need to hear about that um, and we need to plan for that, but that's not a cost that we want to end up passing on to students or the departments. Um, there are resources available to do that. And frankly, uh, the president's told me personally that if we have to dip into reserves to cover testing for campus, we will do that. Okay, thanks, Rex. Next question, how will the job description for the role of the new Meridian Executive Director differ from the current Meridian AVP position? So that's a good question. And the president's office is gonna have some input into that. Um, but the, the goal of that position is, um, at least as it's been um, described to me by uh, Kevin and Danny, uh, is to have that person be um, a public relations kind of individual, um, somebody that um, is likely not from an academic background per se, although I'm not saying that an academic can't apply for the job, but um, but that is uh, the direction that I've been given by the president. Um, so the job description will have, I think, less overall interaction with the academic programs 
um, and involvement. As you know, Patty is currently serving as an interim dean, for example, for part of the College of Health. Um, and this position in the future will not, um, will not include that. Um, so I think that means that some of the duties will be shifted to the rest of the administration of the division. Um, our, our deans, that is Dean of the College of Pharmacy and Dean of the College of Health will take on a greater academic role um, and obviously have to work very, very closely with the, uh, I'm sorry, the executive director of the, of the campus. Okay, thanks Rex. And now I will turn it over to you for any closing statements. Okay. Well, I appreciate, uh, as I've said uh, during the presentation, all that you all have done collaboratively um, to get us to this point in the semester. Um, I would have bet $100 that we wouldn't have made it uh, live and mostly in, in person. Although I know we're doing a lot of online, uh, I, I wouldn't have guessed that we would have made it past uh, October. So for us to be into November with only a couple weeks left to get the end of the semester, I think that it's really been tremendous work by everybody. And it's not just the work in the classroom, it's the work everywhere. It's supporting our students, it's providing counseling services, it's providing all those student services, facilities related services, public safety, et cetera, et cetera. So it really has been a team effort. Um, and I had the privilege of being able to talk with Glenn Nelson to his facilities team yesterday in a couple of town halls and just to, to thank them for all of the work that their people have done to make uh, campus safe, um, to be able to deal with this, to be uh, adherent with our recommendations for face covering use and hand washing and staying home when you're sick and all of those things. So I really appreciate all the work that everybody's done in very, very disruptive times to um, to meet the needs of our students and meet the needs of our mission and our university. And I wanna wish all of you uh, a great holiday season. Um, I know it's gonna be a difficult holiday season because it's gonna be um, difficult to have gatherings and be with family and friends, um, but it's one holiday season and hopefully next year with vaccines and with um, other disease mitigation activities over the course of the year, we'll be back to normal in the holidays and hopefully back to normal in the fall. Um, but thanks very much and happy holidays to all of you. And um, thanks for helping get us uh, almost to the end of the semester here. And we'll knock on wood that we'll uh, make it the next couple of weeks um, to have uh, courses as much uh, as normal as possible. Thanks everybody, appreciate it. And we'll talk to you soon. <laughs>